Good evening. We'd like to call the Durham City Council meeting to order. Tuesday, September the 2nd at 7.02 p.m. And certainly want to welcome all of you that are present with us this evening. Uh, if we could just take a moment for silent meditation, please. Thank you. I'll ask Councilman Brown if he would lead us. And the pledge. All rise. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have one proclamation that I'd like to read this evening. Uh, unfortunately, uh, person Fran Farrell was not able to attend, but it speaks to Constitution Week proclamation. It reads, whereas it is a privilege and duty of the American people to commemorate the 227th anniversary of the drafting of the Constitution of the United States of America with appropriate ceremonies and activities, whereas Public Law 915 guarantees the issuing 
of a proclamation each year by the President of the United States of America, designating September 17th through the 23rd as Constitution Week. Now, therefore, I, William V. Bell Bell, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim September 17th through 23rd, 2014, as Constitution Week in Durham, and urge all citizens to study the United States Constitution and reflect on the privilege of being an American with all the rights and responsibilities which the privilege involves. Mm -hmm. Witness my hand, Corporal Seal, the City of Durham, North Carolina. This is 2nd of September 2014, and we will uh, leave this to be given to Fran Farrell, who is the Regent General Davy Chapter, daughter of the American Revolution. Thank you. As you probably know, for the past month, the City Council has been in closed session uh, for the purpose of evaluating the three employees which uh, we directly hire, uh, the City Manager, the City Attorney, and the City Clerk. We concluded those evaluations uh, this evening in closed session. And in that session, we all unanimously agreed to granting 3% raises to each one of the employees effective July 1st, 2014. And again, I want to say on behalf of the council uh, to the public uh, that we've been very fortunate to have the three city employees that uh, we hired directly. Uh, they've had challenges that they've had to meet. Uh, they've met them very successfully. Uh, they've provided good staff and a lot of the good things that happened in Durham. Why, as the council may receive some of the credit, uh, most of the credit really goes to the administration of this city council, uh, both at the city manager's office, the city clerk, and city attorney's office. Uh, I'd entertain a motion to approve that. So moved. Second. It's been properly moved and second. Uh, Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Uh, Madam Clerk, you got the first and second on that. Okay, thank you. Let me ask first, are there any comments or questions by members of the council? If not, entertain priority items by the city manager. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, uh, everyone, and thank you for that uh, prior uh, motion. Also, uh, this evening, there are no priority items from the city manager. Uh, likewise, city clerk. No items, Mr. Mayor. Likewise, city attorney. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. No priority items. In that case, we will proceed with the agenda as printed, and all I need to do is be able to get my agenda up. Okay. Uh, the first item are the consent agenda items, which may be approved with a single motion. Uh, if a council person or member of the public chooses to pull one of the consent agenda items, we will discuss that item later in the agenda. Again, I'll just read the heading of each one of the consent agenda items. Uh, on the item one is Durham Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Commission appointments. Item two is the Dirty Durham City. County Environmental Affairs Board appointment. Item three is the readoption of City County Emergency Operations Plan. Item four is an item that can be found on the general business agenda. Item five is approval of public and private pre-development costs for the redevelopment of Southside Rental Phase Two with McCormick Barron Salazar Development Inc. And I'll pull that item. Item six is the bid report July 2014. Item seven is the grant project ordinance recognized in 2014 State of Durham's Economy Breakfast Revenues Superseding Ordinance Number 14325. Item eight is telecommunications license agreement with CenturyLink Communications LLC. Item nine is professional services contract ST272C Duke slash Gregson curb extensions. Item 10 is the contract with Bow Habitats Inc. for the Algo Turf scrubber, scrubber Mobile Pilot System Installation and Operation. Item 11 is approval of the 2012 Local Water Supply Plan for the City of Durham. Item 12 is 2014 Unscheduled Pipeline Repairs Contract. I entertain a motion for the approval of the consent agenda with the exception of item 5. Second. It's been moved and seconded by Mayor Pro Tem and Councilman Brown and Councilman Katati. 
Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Okay. The next item is the general business agenda. Uh, item four is the city manager's report in response to recommendations from the Human Relations Commission and Civilian Police Review Board. Uh, let me say this is a general business agenda item, but uh, this item was presented to the city council. The city manager's response was presented to the city council at our work session, our last work session. Uh, some of you may or may not have been here, but uh, we moved the meeting down into the chamber. Again, it was not a public hearing matter, but uh, we allowed for comments on the report. Uh, I indicated at that time that it will be coming back to the general business agenda, uh, specifically for the council to add any comments or recommendations that it might have in reference to the city manager's report. Uh, this is not going to be a public hearing meeting for people to make comments. Uh, we will hear comments from the city council and we will hear responses if the manager so chooses, but I'm not going to get into, again, a discussion of this item. Uh, we, we think that we've been very, very open, transparent in trying to uh, hear what the public had to say on this item and we heard a lot at the last meeting, so this meeting is to hear from the council people specifically and determine what directions, if any, they want to give to the, to the city manager. And I, I'm going to lead off the discussions on this matter. I uh, indicated that the last time I had not had an opportunity to fully review the city manager's response. Uh, as probably most of you know, it was about 131 uh, pages in response to the Human Relations Commission and the Civilian Police Review Board. Let me begin first by saying I had an opportunity to attend the Stop the Violence March this past Saturday at McDougal Apartments. And the march was sponsored by the local branch of the NAACP and uh, various churches. Most of the comments were made at that rally were made about what should and could be done to reduce violence in our community, and how the community and police should be working together. Many of the comments focus on how we as African Americans need to take more personal and community responsibility for, for what is occurring in our community, and the need to be more proactive in helping to guide our young African American boys and girls into positive activities, as well as reporting what we see and know with respect to criminal activities in our communities. I agree with much of what was said at that rally, and I respect the persons for willing to come out and share their thoughts. However, for me, there were two very important points that were made with respect to the police, which I think are very relevant and pertinent to the general business agenda item that we're discussing this evening. And again, that item was the city manager's report in response to recommendations from the Human Relations Commission and Civilian Police Review Board and the issue of community trust in the police department. The first point was that McDougal residents, and there were more than McDougal residents there, but they in particular, would like to see police officers out of their cars more and see them walking their neighborhoods and meeting residents. They voiced the opinions that only residents who felt they would not welcome such an activity by the police or those residents who may be engaged in criminal activities. The second point was that people are concerned that if they report criminal incidents involving persons to the police, the police will tell the criminals which residents, give, which residents gave them information. Therefore, they're very reluctant to give information to the police officer. Now, we had several police officers in attendance at that rally, one of which was Officer Forbes, and he tried to lay that concern by telling persons how they could report crimes or give information in a confidential way. But it's obviously a concern that needs to be addressed. We live in a region where many people have jobs and communities in which they don't live. I think that it is only human nature for those persons that after they leave their jobs and go home, they become more involved and concerned about what happens in their communities and not as vested about the communities where they have jobs but don't live. 
Their vested interest lies more in the communities in which they live rather than communities in which they work, and I can understand and appreciate the level of interest they may have. In some cases, persons may have jobs, such as social workers, teachers, health workers, and et cetera, that require them to have more interaction with the citizens of the communities where they work, and thus they may be more involved in the communities in which they work. For all of our police officers, it is important to have more personal, individual, and community interaction. It helps the residents to get to know them, and likewise for them to know the residents. It also can help in creating valuable relationships and helping officers to perform their duties. And we've seen the high number of officers that do not live in the city of Durham. Uh, 304 out of 520 officers do not live in the city of Durham. Some of them may live in Durham County, but many live outside the city and, and county. And in fact, about 203 of them live in the counties of Wake, Orange, Pearson, and Alamance. For these officers in particular who live outside of Durham City, I think they need to have a more, more interaction with the citizens of Durham other than through such events as National Night Out, uh, PAL, PAL, other block events, and et cetera. I personally would like to see police procedures in place that will require police officers to document the fact that they're spending a certain amount of their patrol time out of their vehicles and meeting and walking neighborhoods. This is, in my opinion, is especially important that it be done in some of our high crime areas. Given the high number of officers who do not live in Durham, I think it is especially important for those officers to become more involved in our neighborhoods by getting out of their vehicles and meeting residents of the neighborhoods that they patrol during their on-duty time. We see this type of interaction in mass once a year during National Night Out. But that, in my opinion, is not enough to cultivate the type of relationships that we need to secure the confidence of our residents, especially those who live in neighborhoods where there's a high incidence of crime. I'm therefore requesting the city manager to give, more, give some serious thought to implementing procedures for our officers to do more foot patrols in these neighborhoods, as he directs the police department. One approach might be to identify certain neighborhoods where this practice could be implemented for a specific duration after which we could determine its impact on the community and its residents. In my opinion, the statement, which is on page 35 of this report, the statement reads, officers are also strongly encouraged to get out of their cars whenever possible and engage people in conversation is not a sufficient response to my concerns. I think that it should be mandate, become mandated as a part of their standard operating procedures and performance plans and documented in a manner that can be, they can be held accountable for, for such foot, foot patrol activity. As I indicated, I've had an opportunity to review the manager's report, response, and executive summary to the Human Relations Commission and Civilian Re Review Board. And I support the manager's recommendations with the exception of his response to HRC 9. My concern is with vehicle searches, not premises, dwellings, other real property for which the Durham Police Department concurs that written consent to search forms should be required. HRC 9 recommendation was that we recommend that a written form be required for all consent searches. This form must be signed by the citizens or detainee and should be available in English and Spanish. In reviewing this issue, I've asked and I'm asking the following questions and it can be answered tonight or some other time. One question I have is, what action can an officer now take if a person refuses to allow their vehicle to be searched? The second question is, if a vehicle search results in the inside or outside of the vehicle being dismantled, who is responsible for reassembling the interior, of exterior or exterior of the vehicle? And if it's the officer's responsibility, I'd like to know how soon must this be done? To me, this answer is especially important. If nothing of a criminal nature is discovered in the vehicle. Are there general orders that cover this question or action? If so, I'd like to what, know what the general order number is, because it wasn't clear on page 55 of the general order, 404R-2, dated April 4, 2014. I'd like to know, was there a general order on this subject before the present general order, and if so, how did it read? And I can tell you from my own personal comments 
that individuals have come to me and have said that they've been stopped, the vehicle has been searched, it's been dismantled, and it's left for them to put it back together. And I've had several people to tell me this, and uh, that is a concern that I have. So I, I really like to have an understanding of what goes on with that. Now, I understand that the court allows a vehicle to be searched without a written consent, but it's done under the following circumstances. If there's a probable cause, if there's an arrest, or the process of being arrested, or of having a reasonable suspicion or a warrant, under those circumstances, a vehicle can be searched. However, bar barring any of these circumstances, I think that a person who has been stopped by the police should be offered the opportunity to sign a written consent before the vehicle is searched. There should be documented audio and or video evidence that the person was asked for their consent to search the vehicle and gave their consent before any vehicle search is con con conducted. I'm not persuaded by any argument that requiring a written consent before searching a vehicle would negatively impact operations or place any extra burden on the officer when he has stopped the vehicle and for the officer to have a written consent form in their hand or on their body as they approach the vehicle. The fact that the Durham Police Department has concluded that in certain circumstances, officers will be directed to obtain the consent of the operator to search the vehicles, acknowledges that consents to search a vehicle are a reasonable request. Requiring a written consent to search a vehicle absent the presence of any of the other circumstances under, upon which a consent to search a vehicle is not required, in my opinion, would not negatively impact police operations. In fact, I think requiring a written consent request before searching a vehicle, in my opinion, will only further, will only further strengthen the desire of the city manager, as he has stated, and he has stated that to signal the repairing and rebuilding of a trusting relationship between the police department and all segments of the Durham community. We as city council members are free to give our individual or collective thoughts and requests to the city manager, both publicly and or privately, and we do. I well understand our city charter on these police matters and that ultimately it is up to the city manager to make a procedural changes in the police department and not the mayor or the city council. But as mayor, I feel an obligation to also give my comments and recommendations on a matter that has taken on the significant importance that it has, it has in our community. The issue of racial profiling remains a concern, and the Durham Police Department says that in carrying out their duties, they do not perform racial profiling. The raw statistics alone, as provided by the Durham Police Department, in my opinion, don't bear that out. In view of the department's denial of performing racial profiling and statistics, I agree with the city manager that a more thorough analysis of circumstances associated with those statistics is needed before conclusions can be drawn. However, I think the city manager should give us a timetable as to when that analysis can be concluded so as to bring back to the city council and the public his conclusions as to whether or not racial profiling exists in the city by the Durham Police Department. It may, be it may be necessary to bring in a credible, independent, outside expert on racial profiling to assist in this effort. But we need to bring some finality to this issue, and we need to do it as soon as possible. Meanwhile, I would hope that the Durham Police Department understands the seriousness of this charge, and going forward, they will make sure that it's not adding to the concerns by its arrest actions. Finally, there is a request by some members of the community that the possession of a small amount of marijuana be made a low enforcement policy, law, low enforcement priority for the police. Here again, I agree with the city manager on his response to this request when he says, and I quote, it would require a, co a coordinated approach and buy-in from the entire criminal justice system to implement. I can assure you that this request has been taken seriously as well as its impact on many young adults. Steps have been taken to engage the appropriate agencies in more discussions on this issue. The final outcome will have to wait for the conclusion of those discussions, and I'm not at this time at liberty to give a time frame for reaching a conclusion at this time, but I can assure you it is being looked at. 
Those conclude my remarks on the report. Again, I thank the manager and his staff have done a great job of going through these reports. We obviously don't have agreement on all issues. But at some point in time, we've got to bring it to a close, direct the manager to do what we think is appropriate, to either support or not support and tell him where we support his recommendations or give our other recommendations. But for me, that is where I am on the city manager's report. Uh, they are my recommendations. And I'm now going to open the council floor for comments from other city council members. Recognize Councilman Kakani. Just before, before you do that, recognize the mayor pro tem, if you have well, a question. It's a, it's a question that might require, it's a question that might require an answer from uh, the police department. So let Well, I recognize Councilman Katani. I happily defer to the mayor pro tem if she wants an answer to a question. I just have general remarks, so. I have a question um, that has to do with um, the racial equity training and how that consultant uh, is being chosen and more information about the content of that training. Uh, Madam Mayor Pro Tem, I think I'd like Mr. Chadwell uh, to, uh, to respond to that at this point uh, since he was the uh, staff person from the city manager's office that, uh, that researched that matter. Keith Chadwell, Deputy City Manager. Madam Mayor Pro Tem and members of council, Mr. Mayor, <clears throat> I believe the question is to the content of the training that's offered, how they were selected. Uh, it, 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 it literally arose out of a fairly exhaustive research on the number of entities across the country that do racial equity training first in general. Uh, but there was a concern to what extent that kind of training might be applied to policing organizations. The organization that's been selected uh, did receive a federal funding to set up an opportunity to do this kind of training as it specifically applies to policing operations without a, without a compromise, I think, to the very content of what goes to the heart of racial equity training in general. The idea is, can we reach in a workforce that is policing? an opportunity for a policing decision to be made based on the substance of the situation that they confront in a thoughtful ma matter versus an automatic reaction to what they might uh, react, to how they might react in terms of their own cultural backgrounds and experiences. So I, I, I personally uh, joined the police department in recommending uh, the organization they've selected. And Keith, just for the record, the, the organization <coughs> is the organization is um, out, of the, uh, out of the University of South Florida, headed by Dr. Lori Fridell, who has very, very strong and solid uh, national credentials on the topic of racial profiling and racial equity training. And Certainly and not the exclusive one in the, in the organization uh, for this nation, but we think this is a good one. But provides a significant number of law enforcement agencies across the country this training. That's correct. Thank you. Oh, so, so then there was not an opportunity for an RFQ, no RFQ. Uh, you just chose someone. And, well, and there wasn't an advertisement of any sort requesting proposals from um, consultants all over the country. You just chose this one. There, there was not, um, and it, it, we, we did go fairly narrowly constricted around some level of expertise in this work as it applies to policing entities. Um, while there are options along those lines and they were considered, uh, we thought this to be the best fit for Durham. It's Councilwoman Katata. Councilwoman Katata, before you do that, uh, I, I think we ought to recognize our new DA, Roger Eccles, uh, is in audience and we had an opportunity to once one in the day. Thank you. Councilman Katani. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you for your remarks. I look forward to talking more about those. Um, as I said at the work session on this matter, I very much appreciate the extensive and thorough review by staff of the HRC and Civilian Police Review Board recommendations and the considerable input by community members and groups. 
I also want to thank the administration and the police department for the initiatives and changes already implemented or underway. I think this response to the HRC recommendations is a good start towards addressing the concerns raised. I do think we can go further in some areas, most notably in the area of vehicle consent searches, exploring the use of body cameras, and accelerating timetables time for data review, among others. I would ask my colleagues that we continue this item to a future work session, whether this Thursday or otherwise, to have a more in-depth discussion on each of the recommendations. Thanks. Thank you. Are there other comments? Councilman Martin. Thank you. Um, you know, it's been nearly a year since Fade first appeared before us uh, raising the issue of institutional racism. Uh, policies and procedures of the Durham Police Department. From the beginning, Fade said it was not about any individual or their actions, but about institutional policies. And there's nothing, there's no silver bullet, there's no action that we can take tonight that can change an institution overnight, that can, can turn it 180 degrees. Um, so these, these issues are going to be ongoing. Um, and so for what I want, I want to echo something that, that um, Councilmember Katati said, which is that the collection, I, I believe that um, we've made great strides already. I believe that, um, that Fade uh, obviously had five requests, the Human Relations Commission, 34 recommendations, the Civilian Police Review Board, 10 recommendations, and to a large extent, um, I believe that the manager has, in his response, has, has um, concurred with a lot of what has been brought up. But in order to move forward with trust, which is in the manager's three points, we need to have transparency and accountability. And so that goes to the collection of data, and it goes to regular reporting of data. And I want the quarterly report on crime statistics to council to begin to include information um, on, on stops. And uh, I, um, I can support written consent. Uh, I can accept documentation. There was a little confusion for me in the report for Fayetteville. I couldn't tell that both written consent and documentation was used interchangeably. I'm not so but absent Fayetteville, so far I don't think anyone has brought up an example of a community where written consent is implemented. Dallas at one point was, but it appears from the report that they actually use documentation, that is video recording, audio recording, um, written consent as a way of um, documenting that consent was given. But I want to see information collected and reported quarterly. I want to know whether or not um, that there's, it's, Difficult. I had really careful comments written out, but I'm like skipping over those um, because um, I, I want to say that first of all, that's something that Councilman Shul said last uh, two weeks ago. I that I believe too, which is that a significant majority of Durham's police officers are dedicated to creating a community where every law-abiding citizen, a resident, feels safe. They act with integrity, but my working assumption is that more than 500 sworn officers, there's a possibility that there are some who don't meet those high standards. And by using the data and recordings, it's, I believe it's possible that we can identify whether there are problems and if there are with whom those problems originate. So we can't change an institution overnight, but we can implement policies which make it possible to um, to observe, to manage, and to um, guide uh, the department in the future if that's necessary. So I want to say this about recruiting from the community. One of the things I've learned over the last two weeks is that um, the recruiting classes are not full. There's an opportunity for anybody in the Durham community who wants, who's qualified and wants to be in the police department to join a recruiting class. That's what I've been told. Um, I've also seen the department recruiting all over the city, so I know that they do that actively. And I also believe, um, as, the as the mayor alluded to, that the work before us is really to find ways to encourage police officers, in my opinion, to live within Durham city limits. On, um, Take your 
Thanks, Steve. Thanks. Uh, on vehicle cameras, I understand the HRC's desire for there to be nonstop dashboard video, but I also understand the challenge of storing the sheer volume of data that would be collected. Under the current procedures, cameras begin recording automatically when the flashing lights are on and when the officer turns the cameras on manually. So I'm comfortable with that if we're collecting data. How many known incidents are unrecorded? And where are those falling? Are there outliers in the, in the is, is every officer have about the same? Or are there officers who have a preponderance of those incidents? And that's the kind of data that I see as needing to collect and to um, analyze. I want to appreciate the department for moving so rapidly on racial equity training. I know the community has concerns over content and skill of facilitators on such a complex topic. I look forward to additional information. Um, the materials provided indicate that the command level training can be held in conjunction with community leaders. And I think it's strategically important for the department to, open, to be open to this possibility. Councilman Shul and I participated in one of the local programs, DR Works, the value of which was firmly rooted in the diversity of the participants. I endorse a training that is as inclusive as possible. On marijuana arrests, as been said, I think the manager's approach is exactly right. Southern uh, Coalition for Social Justice gave council members a number of documents. One of those was an article from the New York Times on the district attorney there deciding to begin uh, dismissing uh, charges. But in that article, it indicated the legislature had actually changed the law and that the local police department in New York City had found ways to circumvent the legislature's desires, all of which pointed out to me is that no one part of the system can make that change. As the manager has pointed out and the mayor has endorsed and is acting on, it requires everybody working in concert. In the service of transparency and accountability, I would like to see published quarterly reports on the number of complaints received by the Professional Standards Division, along with the outcomes. How many are exonerated? How many are upheld? What kinds of disciplinary actions were taken? Uh, I don't need to see uh, individual by individual, but I need to know if there are individual outliers in the data. If 72% of the complaints um, are for one individual, I would like to know that there is an individual collecting that many complaints. And I believe that should be in the quarterly reports as well. Whether the manager's recommendations go far enough is a fair question. And I imagine that there are people on both sides of that issue. What is not open to debate is that we must step forward together. Residents, police, community groups, city government, and we must work collaboratively on creating a more fair and just society, always. Through transparency, the collection and the reporting of information regularly comes accountability, and with that comes trust. I will say that I just, I'm gonna quote Winston Churchill here. Now is not the end, it is not even the beginning of the end, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning. This work is gonna go on for a long time, and I promise that I will be here through that long haul. Thank you, Councilman Marvin. Are there other comments or not? Let me, Councilman Brown. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, and again, I wanna thank the uh, city manager, Tom Bonfill, and for this, I thought, very thorough report. And also to our mayor, Bill Bell, for his, his comments uh, this evening, uh, all of which I concur with. Um, but I do want to speak briefly about the, the issue of marijuana and the high 
arrest rate we see in this city, particularly by African American males. Uh, it is said by some that uh, marijuana can be <clears throat> a gateway drug. Uh, but when you think about it, as we all should, the arrest of our young people especially for housing small amounts of marijuana can also be another gateway. And that is a, a gate that leads into our jails and into our criminal justice system. A system where too often we find that our prisons become not places of rehabilitation, but schools, colleges, graduate schools of crime. And as a result, is when the, those arrested uh, who eventually come out are more hardened and perhaps more criminally activated than they were when they first went in. Uh, so our system itself too often inducts and induces more criminal behavior. You know, it is said that uh, sometimes the people are ahead of their government and particularly to our criminal justice system. I read recently a Pew poll that close to 75% of the American population would favor drug treatment and rehabilitation as opposed to simply throwing people in jail to incarcerate them. Now obviously there are, are those who say that, uh, call it whatever you want, decriminalization of marijuana, having it within our police department be a much lower priority, that this is a complex issue that needs buy-in from a variety of local state and even federal agencies. They are right, of course. That's true. But this does not, in my judgment, prohibit this city from taking this issue much more seriously than we have in the past by engaging in further research and hopefully further actions along this lines within the Durham Police Department. Uh, it is our young people who are really being crucified by this. And eventually it must come to a stop. We need a common, we need what we do not have now, in my judgment, a common sense solution to this challenge. Thank you, Mr. Welcome. Are there any other comments? I recognize Councilman Davis, Councilman Shul, and the Mayor Pro Tem in that order. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, uh, Councilman Brown's comments about school uh, rings a bell. I, I certainly agree with him about what happens once people are in, incarcerated. But I also think that we ought to have a discussion that combines the collective input that we have gotten on this issue from lots of different people. We've heard from uh, the police, we've heard from the administration, we've heard from council members, we've heard from the community, uh, we've heard from um, people talking through the media. Um, we also have heard lots of discussions about how we ought to be able to deal with this issue of police versus the community. And I don't think it ought to be one versus the other. I think the learnings that we may have 
captured over the last month or so when we look at the Midwest, um, there are some things that happened in those locations that ought never to happen in Durham and that we ought to work together to make sure that they don't happen. I think we ought to make sure that we surround the young people while they are free and not incarcerated that we have a community dialogue around the things that have been brought up from the Human Relations Commission report, the city manager's report, and all of the people who involve themselves in that report, but embrace the young people that we have so that they won't be in a position where they will have to be them versus the police. We've got some work to do in that arena, and I think this community is smart enough savvy enough and articulate enough to make sure that we do some things that will prevent young people from being in a situation where we avoid the formal schooling and end up with the schooling that Councilman Brown is talking about. It behooves all of us to work real hard through this report and through this community effort to bring that about. I want to thank the administration particularly and the far-reaching inclusion that they've had to try to deal with this issue and I certainly want to thank the community uh, to for embracing the issue and trying to make sure that we prevent uh, issues here in Durham from escalating to the place to the point where they have escalated in the Midwest so thank you very much and I look forward to working with everybody to bring about this change thank you councilman Davis Recognize Councilman Shul and then the Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I'm, I made uh, extended remarks, I would say, two weeks ago, so I'm not going to do that again. But uh, I did want to uh, uh, reiterate a couple of things. First of all, uh, I think it's great that it seems to be an emerging consensus, uh, a, a consensus emerging on the Council about uh, written consent. And I think that's critically important. and. I'm appreciative of my colleagues speaking out on that very much. Um, I'm really glad uh, that Mr. Eccles is here uh, because his office would play a key role in anything that we do regarding the uh, low-level enforcement of, of uh, uh, enforcement of low-level drug offenses. And it's great to see you here, Mr. Eccles, and congratulations on your new post. I know you'll do a fantastic job at that. Um, and I appreciate, Mr. Mayor, your leadership and the actions you've already taken just in the last two weeks to push that along. And, and I think it's really, it's great leadership. And um, you, it's, it's, uh, it's really important. And thank you. Uh, I want to, again, thank the city manager, the community groups, the Human Relations Commission, Civilian Police Review Board, and everyone who's contributed to the process. And it's really been a really good process and I, I've appreciated the city manager saying several times recently that this has been th this is hard but this is good this is what we need and I've appreciated his attitude about that and I, and I think that everyone in this community has contributed uh, has made this process a good one and we have to keep moving ahead with it um, I do believe in the decriminalization of marijuana. We're not going to get that from the state legislature, so we have to figure out what we're going to do here in Durham. I also want to just uh, say that I know that uh, for the police department, this is a difficult time. It's hard to be criticized. I mean, I'm an I'm elected official. I signed up for it. Uh, but uh, these officers who were on the streets, I, I know from talking to several of them, many of them, uh, that they do feel under fire, that they do feel like there is pressure being put on them, uh, and that they are, in some cases, being unfairly maligned. And what I want to say about our department is this. It's an excellent police department. It's an excellent police department. We have 515 uniformed officers, and these people are working very hard to protect us every day under very difficult circumstances. Young people often called upon to make really difficult decisions. And I think if we're going to move ahead as a community, it's really important that we have their buy-in and leadership. And to that extent, not only do we need to make changes where they're necessary, but we also need to be supportive of those people who are out there on our behalf. And 
this is a this is a difficult but important fine line to walk and I urge members of the community to walk that line with us and with our department yes we need to make changes but we also need to acknowledge the really good and critically important daily work that the department does so uh, mr. mayor I really appreciate your comments and the comments of my colleagues and I feel good that we're going to move ahead and do some really good uh, things in Durham thank you welcome recognize the mayor pro tem Thank you, Mr. Mayor, for uh, your comments, and I would like to thank everyone who has participated in this uh, process, especially uh, the Human Relations Commission and those citizens who were willing to come and share with us uh, what has happened to them um, in this community. Now, I appreciate the work of our law enforcement personnel. In fact, I thank them on an ongoing basis for their work. Uh, their, their good goes without question, but the not so good is the reason for the discussions that we're having. The community has spoken and we cannot afford to wait too long to get some concrete action in place, itemizing for the community uh, everything that needs to be changed, that will be changed, that needs to be done as soon as possible. And I think we need a deadline to, to, deal, to deal with that. Um, community has spoken. Uh, we can't afford to wait too long uh, for something else to happen here. Thanks everybody for coming out. Um, the piece that really concerns me the most is uh, how young black men have told us that they have been stopped arbitrarily by police officers. And so the written consent needs to be in place as soon as possible. And I know it's legal to do it, and I think that's one of the first steps we can take because we can take that step. And we should take this step now. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Let, let me um, conclude this, this, this part of the uh, agenda. Uh, Councilwoman Katari has indicated she would like to have further discussion on this at our work session Thursday. And I don't have a problem with that. I don't think anyone else has a problem with that. Uh, but I, I think we, we really have got to bring this to a conclusion relative to the work that's been done. Uh, we've had the Human Relations Commission to spend six months on it. Uh, we began now. The city manager spent almost two months in compiling this report. Uh, we first spoke to it publicly at our last work session. We're speaking with it again this evening. Uh, we'll speak to it again Thursday at the work session. Uh, what I'd like to encourage my colleagues to do so we can really move forward, uh, we've seen the 43 recommendations plus that the city manager has recommended. Uh, I think we owe it to him as well as to the public to let him know which of these we support and which we don't support, or if we're going to tweak any of them, suggest how it might be tweaked. And I like to get that done at the work session so he can move forward, the public can move forward, and we can move forward on this particular item. So that's going to be my suggestion for our work session Thursday. Come prepared to decide which of these recommendations you support or don't support or you want tweaked so we can bring some finality to that and, and move forward. Do you need a motion? I, I don't think it's that's okay. consensus by, we, 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 we can go with that. I recognize the city manager. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and certainly I want to uh, take this opportunity to thank uh, each of the members of council uh, for, as usual, your thoughtfulness, uh, but in particular the direct feedback that uh, you are so comfortable uh, providing to us in, in terms of, uh, of what you're thinking. Um, you know, it's been my experience, uh, certainly with this council, as much as any that I've ever worked for, that uh, when, when we have the, uh, the direct collectful thoughts of the mayor and the council uh, as the elected representatives of the, uh, of the community interacting with the, uh, the staff's uh, best professional research and, and information, that we end up with the best results, and certainly not only the best results, but clarity of intent. Uh, I think that uh, there are times when, uh, when we communicate individually 
that we think we hear one thing, but when we communicate collectively and have a chance to discuss them more thoroughly, as is being suggested, maybe at uh, at a work session format, that uh, we can be absolute certain about uh, about uh, the clarity of our intent. Um, certainly, heard many thoughts tonight, some of which for the first time. So I'd like you know a little little time to. Uh, uh, to process those, but uh, before I may make a response, but we'll we'll be prepared to talk about that on on Thursday. Um, as I indicated, uh, uh, and and also to to answer hopefully answer some of the questions that were raised tonight, although there may be a few that are going to require a bit more research and and may take a little longer. I think I had indicated um, earlier uh, a couple weeks ago that uh, you know as a part of the the transparency uh, of of this uh, follow up going forward. Uh, we would be developing a, uh, a matrix, if you want to call it that, with a timeline of all of the actions that we, uh, we anticipated uh, would be taken. Many of those actions are administrative in nature and are already underway. Some of them uh, we will be bringing back to you that require you know, some follow-up action from you. And then as we heard tonight, I think there are some areas that, uh, that you wish to provide uh, collectively more direction that we'll be responding to as well. So we'll be prepared uh, in a very short order to answer a couple of your questions to uh, to have this um, uh, action uh, matrix, so to speak, completed and uh, and uh, posted, you know, on the website, so that uh, the community will know all of the uh, uh, the actions and uh, as they're uh, as they're finalized. And the uh, the projected timelines for those uh, completions, and then we'll be updating those with with status reports along the way. So, clearly, you know, I'm committed, and I know the staff of the police department and our city manager's office staff is is uh, committed to continue to uh, to give our best efforts and and work on this issue, but also be very transparent about the uh, the work that we're doing. And as many of you have have uh, have referenced back to uh, to some of my comments about the. The issues of transparency and accountability leading to trust. I do firmly believe that's the case, but uh, we will be prepared to, uh, to to continue with this discussion Thursday. Uh, I I don't want to uh, promise that we're going to have 100% of the answers within 48 hours, but uh, but we certainly um, will be prepared to to have a uh, a very thorough conversation uh, so that we can uh, we can have a you know good interaction and a uh, in collective discussion with you. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Manager. We're going to move to item five, which was pulled from the consent agenda. Uh, recognize Ms. Stella Adams. This was approval of public and private redevelopment costs. Ms. Adams, you have three minutes. Thank you. Um, my name is Stella Adams. I live at 4128 Cobblestone Place in Durham, North Carolina. Um, I am by profession a fair housing expert and serve as senior consultant to the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development uh, as a senior policy advisor to the, the Patricia Roberts Harris National Fair Housing Training Academy on the issue of affirmatively furthering fair housing and fair housing issues. I uh, pulled this item because I would like the administration to share with the public um, how they whether this contract being awarded is in compliance with Section 3, um, and if so, what is it, what has been done to ensure that Section 3 residents, Section 3 businesses, and Section 3 contracts, um, subcontractors have been um, put in place. So I'd like to know what the Section 3 um, compliance is on this contract. Also, I'm back home now, and I'll be asking this question every time there is a, a federal dollar attached above $100,000. So in the future, I'm asking the city council to make that part of any reporting that is done. So I would ask the city council not to approve a $900,000 expenditure without making sure that we're in compliance with our federal regulation. Mr. Johnson, could you uh, address that, and in particular the fact that the staff, I think, had already developed a, a Section 3 plan previous to this, and whether or not that still is in compliance? 
Yes, we, yes uh, Reginald Johnson, Director of Department of Community Development. Yes, the uh, City of Durham has uh, developed a Section 3 uh, plan that was approved at the beginning of the Southside Revitalization Project, did come before the City, city Council, has been in effect through Phase 1 will be in effect uh, as we move forward with any additional phases. We have also reported uh, on Section 3 uh, consistently as we've gone through Phase 1. This phase, this particular item is for design of Phase 2 uh, is the purpose, and so it will be uh, the same rules that uh, we have been following all along. Section 3 should be done. You should know what the plan is, how the money is going to be allocated to subcontractors prior to the award of the contract, not afterwards. If you report, if the sub, if the sub recipient is reporting after the fact, then they're just doing their best effort, and that does not guarantee that it's being delivered. Please note that I will be putting in a FOIA request knowing how the Section 3 was applied to the previous phase and to how it is applied here. And I will be um, filing if it's not done in compliance. Thank you. Mr. Manager, do you have any comments on this? This was a Senate item with uh, recommended action. I think if, the, uh, if there's any other questions, certainly contact the Department of Community Development and they'll be more than happy to uh, provide the, uh, the details on that. Thank you. Entertain a motion on item. Move the item. Been properly moved and second moved by the Mayor Pro Tem, second by Councilwoman Katadi. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Thank you. Any other items to come before the Council? If not, the meeting is adjourned at 8.01 p.m. Thank you.